All right. Greetings to you all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Grace, mercy, and peace abound to all those who call on the name of the Lord in truth. Today I was asked a question uh, from my uh, Russian-speaking audience. So the question was posed about the issue of inspiration, inspiration of the Bible and the preservation of the sacred text. But more specifically, the question concerned are particular translations inspired? Does the inspiration also uh, in, inform a certain version of that text? Is, is a certain a text, uh, I mean translation, inspired? And what about the different manuscripts and the theories of uh, the critical text versus uh, ecclesiastical or textus receptus? How do we know? And uh, can we know anything with certainty concerning all of this plethora of conflicting uh, schools of thoughts and, and all the information about it and the versions, especially in the uh, English speaking uh, segment of Christendom, widely speaking, you know, broadly speaking, um, that uh, you have uh, so many Bible translations. And so how, how do we know if we can know anything with certainty? with respect to inspiration, or is, is any translation that is to be preferred, is it inspired? And of course, the uh, most of it comes from this KGV-only debate, uh, which is peculiar, of course, uh, to the English-speaking segment of, uh, again, the broadly speaking Christendom, the people who um, call themselves Christians by, by some sort of association. So, but it's an interesting, a question and frankly as to the technicalities of it it is way too deep for myself to have any safe authority if I, it's it's only in my pedestrian level that I can address the issue but the the in the bottom line uh, I hope that this little uh, music will be of benefit to you all because I have thought on this issue for quite some time and here's my best shot uh, on the issue okay as regards the belief in translations of the Bible and, and how we take uh, the stance a stance on um, on this um, issue of manuscripts of critical versus ecclesiastical texts and so forth the bottom line it's always sola fideism it's always by faith in certain presuppositions. Let me explain. I saw a post on the internet, um, uh, someone um, articulated well that uh, everybody is a believer of, of sorts, you know, that everybody goes around in this life believing something. We, uh, it is sort of by faith. We all walk by faith in, in, in the sense that uh, we cannot verify all information that comes our way so we sort of we trust with the trust it's so it's unfair if for instance the atheists will say well you guys you you religious folk uh, you believe by heart and so forth you jump into the dark uh, of uh, in the irrational realm whereas we we believe we trust in science because it is so reasonable it is confirmed and therefore our convictions says the atheist, uh, are based upon verified science or scientific research. Well, of course, it's hogwash because they also go, they proceed by believing. It's everybody is a presuppositional in the sense that uh, it is a certain uh, sets of, or maybe a couple of basic axiomatic beliefs that people take for granted. They never question them. They never prove them because they're first principles, as it were. So people either believe that uh, what you can touch, smell, and uh, you know, handle, and, and such things as that, uh, you trust in the so-called verified uh, data, and you proceed by that, by theories which are built upon those uh, data, or you believe in a revelation. So that as far as the origins of the world, of course, uh, the, the two major views is that uh, either 
all came out of nothing by chance. And there's uh, all sorts of sophisticated wrappings uh, to, uh, to kind of present this uh, otherwise ridiculous idea that nothing um, in the beginning was nothing, nothing was with nothing, and nothing uh, uh, was nothing. And uh, nothing that came into being was uh, out of nothing and so forth. <laughs> Just the rephrasing for, uh, uh, for uh, John first chapter, first verses. But uh, in the beginning, nothing created nothing. But that's the atheistic presupposition. Uh, they say, well, we don't know everything that, that's far, but you proceed on this presupposition that the science can supply uh, enough evidence, which is a falsehood because there's never enough evidence for everything. You have to have an exhaustive uh, treasure of data to infer from. Therefore, all knowledge by inference is necessarily false because it is based upon in insufficient data. You never have enough. That, that's why the so-called scientists, they build their theories and then they have, well, then they scratch their heads uh, down the road 30, 40 years. Well, they did know that. Now we have a better understanding of such and such. Or this side of the experiment was not taken into account. Or they didn't have sufficient detectors of such waves or such uh, molecules or whatever that may be. Uh, but uh, it's always gaining and never arriving. But we, Christians, we proceed on the principle that God spake, He spoke, and He revealed. So we believe in His revelation. Now, let's, without any further chit-chat, let's uh, get to the uh, bottom line. So what is our faith? And by faith, I, I, I mean the, in, the, in the sense that Judah uses that word. Contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. And that faith is not just your believing, it is the body of knowledge. So, the, the, uh, what we're supposed to believe. And so, it is, of course, by revelation. Now, revelation, God did uh, speak in various uh, ways, uh, diverse ways to the fathers, but in these last days, He spake in His Son, as, as says the book of Hebrews. Now, we have that information, that revelation inscripturated, in what we call the Bible. Now, we believe that all Scripture came by an inspiration. All Scriptures God breathed, as says Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16. So it is by inspiration. God inspired. So the Holy Ghost moved Isaiah, Moses, John, uh, Habakkuk, whoever else, all of those human penmen of His revelation. And so we have in this collection of books the revelation of Jesus Christ, because He is the center of that uh, revelation. This is an important observation, that He is the center and He is the subject matter of Scriptures. Now, back to the uh, original questions on uh, inspiration. Many people uh, and Christians say, well, we believe in inspiration, but we use the so-called critical text. You all heard about the critical editions. Nestle and Allen second or third edition. I, I don't know how many editions because I never, uh, I don't keep uh, uh, following the news on the, on the developments because they always add something else. They make additions and so forth. But they too proceed from certain presuppositions. The so-called critical text theory originated with a bunch of German liberals in the 19th century. And the, the 19th century was characterized by a crisis in Christian theology. I mean, not just in systematics. It was an onslaught of just liberal uh, theology. And people questioned and uh, doubted and debunked er uh, so many things. Basically, everything that was of a supernatural import from the Bible. And I said, well, we got to, you know, um, ought to go a quest, venture out on the, set out on the quest for real Jesus. He was real, just the real sayings of Jesus. And just uh, get rid of all, all that trappings, the ecclesiastical additions, so forth. So they set out 
with this presupposition that uh, there may be some truth to Christianity, to, to its claims, but most of it was invented until by the church herself down through the centuries. And we've got to get down to the real Jesus. And also, we need to find the real Bible. So that's how this, of course, this is a pedestrian way of putting it. That there's more, you know, there's books written on the subject. But uh, in essence, what I'm saying to you is true about the origins of the so-called critical uh, approach to the Bible. They said, look, we do have the Bible now, but it's full of emendations and additions and so forth because the ecclesiastical scribes, as they uh, would uh, work on uh, transcribing the manuscripts, you know, for long centuries before the printing press was invented, it was just a process of the, you know, by hand, they would uh, make copies of the existing manuscripts. And so these critical guys, they said, look, we have, uh, you know, all of this walking on water, all this stuff, feeding the 5,000, just, uh, just uh, many of those things were invented and added. For instance, the, uh, all of the verses in the Bible that exalt the divinity of Christ or clearly portray Christ as God. It must have been letter edition and so forth. And also they begin to discover some manuscripts, okay, the pieces of the parchment and the, the on which they had the remaining, um, uh, you know, passages, uh, some fragments of uh, sacred texts, which had different endings and sometimes different Variants of uh, the same verses. And they were dated fairly earlier on. And they said, look, we have some ancient manuscripts which present a different picture. So, for instance, um, they have omissions, important omissions. Uh, the uh, uh, text about the woman taken in adultery is not there or the longer ending of Mark, so to speak, is not there. In many verses, which traditionally exalt Jesus as Lord, as God, are not there. For instance, the famous, I'll give you a couple of instances right out, uh, right out of, uh, of my head right now, is um, in 2 Timothy, uh, no, it's actual 1 Timothy 3.16, the famous uh, summation of the Christian faith. Uh, remember, this is 1 Timothy 3.16 where it says, uh, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, there are some manuscripts which say, in the, in the latter part of that verse, that he was manifest in the flesh. Not God was manifest, just he was manifest. That he became flesh. Well, he was referring that uh, Christ was indeed manifest in the flesh. Well, that's true, but it's kind of redundant. Of course he came in, uh, he, he was incarnate. I mean, he lived as a man. He was born in a manner of man. He was not conceived in the common matter, as we all know, but he was born otherwise, just as all human babies come into this world. And he lived like a man to the age of 33 some uh, years. Uh, about that, that age, he was crucified. But see, they say, well, aha, uh -huh. we have some manuscripts which say he was manifest, not God. So it must have been that some scribe thought, well, maybe we need to build up our Christian faith. So they made this unworded addition, amendation in the text, and they changed it, he, into a god, so as to, again, against the uh, uh, rising heresies of Arianism and other schismatics, to uphold the doctrine of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Or this uh, addition to the Lord's Prayer, as they call it addition. As you all know, the uh, the Lord the so-called Lord's Prayer, as given in Matthew six, has the very last line: "For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory." 
Now, the so-called critical editions or uh, critical versions do not have that very last line. They say, well, it was kind of, they say, well, it was added for the purpose of edification. It's just a nice sounding religious kind of wrap up of that prayer, but the, the most ancient and reliable, they say, they claim, manuscripts do not have that, uh, uh, that addition. It's just this stops that uh, leaders not to temptation. That, that's it. Uh, in the so-called uh, most ancient uh, remaining manuscripts. Now, the origin. Now, there are some manuscripts which differ from what we have, for instance, in King James uh, version of the Bible or some other Bibles, which are, uh, I mean, translations based upon the so-called traditional or ecclesiastical or textus receptus. And they say, look, uh, those manuscripts are all therefore they must be true. And we have them. We found those. Uh, we've made those discoveries and they're kept in the uh, in uh, different places. Well, that is true, but the question should be asked, why is it that those manuscripts have been kept for so long as sort of as a uh, museum artifacts and they were not in use? See, the manuscripts, the body of manuscripts, which was always in the process of making copies of and reproducing and passing to new generations of the church and to God of, to God's people to make the Bible available, those would be so much in use that would wear out and be replaced by newly uh, rewritten uh, version. So you get the point so that the older ones would be discarded because they've been so much in use. They would wear out, whereas those were sort of set aside. And it is, the believing folks' presupposition is that, first of all, if God truly inspired the Bible, which we believe, I mean, otherwise, if you don't believe in the inspiration of the Bible, let's just, just close up and go home. We have no basis for believing. And I'm just making noises. I'm not saying anything of significance. If the Bible is not true, I mean, just let's close up. We believe in the inspiration. If the word of the Lord is pure, it is it is kept pure also. See, there is a connection, and it's a natural and logical and unavoidable connection, in my opinion, between inspiration and preservation. All right? The Westminster Confession of Faith, in the first chapter of its uh, 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 that said confession, which is of the whole uh, sacred scripture, as a beautiful written, I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, the, uh, ar uh, this uh, article devoted to sacred scripture is probably the best uh, uh, confessional statement written on the subject of inspiration and, uh, and just the Bible, defending the, the Bible, its necessity for us that uh, we need it. And it also defends the, the um, idea that God not only gave the revelation, but he, by his singular care, he kept those books, which are, you know, the, the, uh, the originals, pure, down through the ages for the church. He inspired and he kept it so that we might have it pure. You know, we have uh, verses that uh, we use for devotion, and uh, let's, uh, let's uh, I'll just, uh, I'll give you First Peter, for instance, um, that God, the Word of God, the Word of the Lord endureth forever. People love these uh, verses because it brings assurance to them, but the, impl the clear implication, it's right there, it's on the surface, that, but the Word of the Lord, well, first of all, for all flesh is, is as grass in the glory of man as the flower of, the, of grass, the grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. See, we all just like vapor, okay? It's a transitory existence. We just pass quickly and then we're gone. In contrast with our, uh, with, with our uh, passing 
existence, the word of the Lord endures forever. It abides by, by nature because it is eternal. It also has this connection. And I would say the major connection that the word in the beginning was the word. The second blessed person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ, is that eternal pre-existing word. And he also, that word, has been given to us in so many words that we have in the Bible. And these words all bear witness and testify of that word which became flesh. There is a connection between the word. I mean, basically Peter says, and that word was, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So centrally, it is Christ himself as that word which is preached to you. Okay? But it stands to if if Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, so must the witness of him be. If Christ is reliable, then the witness of him must also be reliable, without emendations, without all the tinkering about the text, which the critical people suggest has occurred down through the ages. They say, well, we got to find the true text. So all if, uh, the implication is um, this. If you're using NAS, New American Standard Bible, or New International Version, or English Standard Version, which has been heralded, oh, this is a true conservative in the tradition of King James and all other venerable translations of the past. We present to you all this ESV Bible, but it's also based upon this corrupt, redacted version of the Bible, based upon the so-called critical text. And again, um, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I'm proceeding... Uh, kind of in spirals, but going back to the original things, that we all believers in something, we all proceed by believing, we all sola fides in the sense that it is by faith alone in something. It's Usually it is, is a presupposition that we never question, we take for granted. So you either believe a bunch of unbelieving liberal scholars of the 19th century, none of whom was an orthodox or evangelical, let alone reformed Christian or Calvinistic, or Sovereign Grace, however you want to put it. They were all liberals, all of them. They didn't believe in, the, in, the, in, the, in Jesus in which we believe. Okay, They did not share our beliefs. And they proceeded upon the assumption that the clergy has corrupted the original text, and we've got to get to it. And we're going to use the same approach that you would use to any other document, presupposing that those who made copies were dishonest, corrupt people who wanted to make additions to sound it better. Okay? That's the presupposition of those critical scholars. Okay? On the other hand, if you believe that God has inspired the text and nothing is impossible, nothing is too hard for God, if you got God who raises the dead, why can't you presuppose that he has actually preserved that text? Not only inspired it, but preserved it down through the ages. I mean, it's kind of natural. It, it seems pretty logical that God would not leave it to man just to do it as they please, but that he would providentially preserve it. Otherwise, what's the point? I mean, if we have a Bible which is full of unwarranted uh, additions and additions, you get the point. So, and uh, and uh, I remember when I uh, when I was converted uh, back in the uh, mid nineties. Uh, and uh, we had uh, all all these uh, Bibles, and uh, I was uh, studying English at that point, and the NIV was kind of big. It was being promoted by everybody. Oh, boy, it's just so easy to understand, especially 
to you or not because you're you're not native speaker i'm not you know i you know, speak with a russian accent to this day that is true and so forth so that it's just a it's a better it's an updated language and it's all made easier for yes easier but not necessarily it's not a better version it's not a progress over the old king james these days i'm using if i'm using the english text i'll quote from the king james it is the translation which i generally trust now i'm not a KG, king james only person now king J, uh, king james uh, only uh, people are kind of fruitcakes in a sense that they insist that king james is inspired see the Westminster, to which I refer the Confession of Faith, says that the originals are immediately inspired, of course. Then we have sort of emanations that uh, believing folks, and it has to be, the, again, the ecclesiastical text, it is the prerogative of the church. So believing people, believing scholars, should take care to translate it into so-called vernacular languages. From whatever culture they come from, they started the originals and then they make faithful, painstakingly faithful translation of the original manuscript, which have been kept pure down through the ages into their respective languages. And the King James, the history of King James, you know, you know the story. If I mean, you can read in the uh, uh, the preface to the uh, the first original uh, sixteen eleven editions and the later editions, it was an illustrian, illustrious uh, assembly of scholars who knew all of the original languages so well and were also believers. So that may, that what makes the King James so, so special. They were really good scholars and they were believers. And there was a just, and they, they produced this. So, yes, there are archaic expressions here and there that, uh, boy, sometimes you have to figure out what it meant, you know, that he was not, that he was there. And that just some expressions that are all fashioned. But otherwise, it is a pretty faithful translation. They also believe in the word for word uh, translation that it has to be pretty close to the original because every word of the Lord is pure. See, Today, the prevailing notion in the Bible translation uh, business, which is, it is a business, you know, the lucrative uh, as such, because they produce all this never ending and they sell them, sell them well, the, uh, the so-called versions. Well, the prevailing view is that it's a dynamic equivalent. So it's not just the word, it's just the idea, what they really thought. So then you're left at the mercy of those translators because what you get for instance in the niv and some other paraphrastic versions is not the every word which proceeded from the mouth of god but just the thought so of course then the argument of paul in galatians 3 about the seed singular which refers to christ and to thy seed after thee so if it's offspring or descendants, as the modern verses use, then the argument of Paul as that seed, as referring to Christ, is absolutely lost. You get it? Or in Hebrews, if quoting Psalm, from Psalm 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him, that is actually, that has made him a little lower than the angels. Paul in uh, Hebrews 2 is uh, referring that, I mean, he's explaining that as referring to Christ, which it is. All scripture is about Christ. Or, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, and that blessed man who is planted by the, uh, you know, streams of, the, of waters is none other but Christ. He becomes that tree which bears its fruit in its season and so forth he is that blessed man but in the modern inclusivistic well blessed are those or happy are those and so forth they change they say well we just we want to communicate the thought not necessarily those patriarchal uh uh words that the man of course we, we understand it's not just man it's a it's woman it's just they everybody who uh is faithful to the Lord is meant by that. And so 
they make all these uh, emendations to, to suit it to the modern uh, understanding so that we get uh, what they think needs to be gotten from the text and so the, uh, the original wording is lost. And then the arguments about the Christolog Christological implication of all those texts is also lost. So, so you, you get what I'm saying. Now, um, back to the main thought. You don't have to worry about all of the technicalities and intricacies of the arguments. Uh, the debate is an ongoing thing. You may have heard of the name James White. This uh, Reformed Baptist is an is accomplished debater, an apologist for Christian faith in general. He debates with Muslims and, and people like that, and so with Roman Catholics and uh, you name it. And he also is a staunch defender of the so-called critical text, and he mocks the traditionalist people uh, like myself who believe in the divine preservation. And he also uses uh, the designer's tactics of uh, uh, kind of smearing and labeling everybody who holds to the ecclesiastical church. Ah, oh, you're kind of, you're KGV only. No, I'm not. Uh, by the way, there, there, there are other translations available in English time right now, which are based upon the right body of manuscripts, which is the ecclesiastical received text. And I would recommend not, not only... The King James, King James would probably be the main version. Uh, well, it, it's, it's tried to test. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it has many other good fish. Overall, it is probably the best to this day. There is also the Green's Little Translation, LITV, the uh, abbreviation that is used. If you find it, it's also free. It's, uh, you can locate it online. You can download it. And there's also Young's Little Translation. Okay, these three, Young's is kind of wooden, it's, it's hard to follow. It wouldn't be the first choice for reading and devotion because it's, it's very hard to read. It's just so chopped up. It, is, it tries to be so, so very little that it's hard to read. But it is based upon, it, it tries to be word for word and is based upon the right um, body of manuscripts. And there's some other. New King James is not as good because they, even though it is also based mainly upon the received text, but they make in the footnotes, they make uh, uh, this observation. Well, the oldest manuscripts do not have this. So, so. They, again, they're inserting this poison of the critical thinking. They also change a very critical thing, in my opinion which makes the new King James far inferior to the old King James. And, that, and this is this. In all of the instances of justification by the faith of Jesus Christ or through the faith of Christ, it, uh, it is also follows this, uh, again, presuppositional belief in... Uh, in uh, in an idea that Christ, it couldn't be his faith. See, see, the problem is that they encounter this phrase in the original. The Greek genitive, which says, Peace is Christu, faith of Christ. So, well, it cannot be his faith. It must be our faith in him. So that based, again, it's everybody is a solo fetist. Everybody proceeds upon certain assumptions which they believe take for granted. Say, well, this cannot be Christ's faith. It must be our believing in him. Therefore, they insert this preposition in. In all of the seven critical instances where it says that uh, it's been disclosed the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ, through the, by faith in Jesus Christ that is disclosed. How come it's manifested through your faith? It is presented to your faith, but it's manifested through Christ's faithfulness. But it's completely blurred and obscured by this unwarranted insertion of the preposition in. And that's uh, one of the problems with the new uh, King James. And therefore, it, it makes it, it uh, it's not as, uh, not as good, not as faithful as the King James. Okay. So again, to sum it up, to wrap it up, this uh, it's been kind of longer than I wanted, uh, this uh, uh, discussion. 
you don't have to be a scholar to take a stance because I mean if you hear if you listen to people like James White he use all his jargon little language he will refer it to different manuscripts and datings and so forth and all those intricate documents and so forth but at the end of the day how do you know because, because again if you proceed upon this empirical uh, basis of acquired knowledge epistemology by collecting data and making inferences therefrom, you always end up having an insufficient database. Well, because you do not have exhaustive knowledge of everything that's, that's happening. That's the problem with science. It always gropes in the dark. Whereas, if you take the stance of that, that God did speak clearly, that he gave us his word, that every word of the Lord is pure, and it has been kept pure, you receive the Bible, and it stands to reason that it's the same Bible that people had centuries ago. It is that simple. You either believe that the Bible has been inspired and it's been kept, or you believe in the so-called science, unbelieving science, which will tell you which Bible you should read yourself. So you have to, you have to choose in this regard. And it's, all, uh, it's always by presupposition, all right? I hope that's somewhat helpful. Talk to you next time. Okay, God bless you all.